Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. And welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project podcast. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm an assistant director of the Regulatory Transparency Project here at the Federalist Society. Today, on this fourth branch podcast, we're delighted to host a discussion on TikTok and the potential of a TikTok ban. To address that topic, we have with us today a stellar group of cyber and privacy experts who I'll introduce briefly before we jump into the discussion. First off, we're joined by Will Duffield, who is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute, where he studies speech and internet governance. His research focuses on the web of government regulation and private rules that govern American speech online. Also joining us today is Jamil Jaffer, who's the founder and executive director of National Security Institute at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, where he also serves as an assistant professor of law, director of the National Security Law and Policy Program, and director of the Cyber Intelligence and National Security LLM Program. Professor Jaffer also teaches classes on counterterrorism, intelligence, surveillance, cybersecurity, and other national security matters. Finally, we're delighted to have with us Jennifer Huddleston as our guest host for this podcast. Ms. Huddleston is a Technology Policy Research Fellow at the Cato Institute. Her research focuses on the intersection of emerging technology and law, with a particular interest in the interactions between technology and the administrative state. Ms. Huddleston's work covers topics including antitrust, online content moderation, data privacy, and the benefits of technology and innovation. Now, in the interest of time, I've kept my introductions of our guests brief, but if you'd like to know more about any of our guests today, please feel free to visit regproject.org and read their impressive full bios. With that, however, I'll stop talking, hand it over to our host, Ms. Huddleston, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, for hosting this forum for us to to talk about a topic that's been in the news a lot, particularly since the start of 2023. TikTok became a very popular social media app very quickly. And when it first emerged during the early 2020, during 2020, what we saw was a lot of discussions that were similar to other social media apps, questions around the content moderation policies, the data privacy, youth online, and many other topics. However, over the last few years, there have been a lot of questions raised about any relationship between TikTok and its parent company, ByteDance, with ties to China. There have also been debates at both a state and federal level about whether or not this app that first became known for popular dance crazes is it should be banned because of these connections out of concerns for national security. But what we've also seen, though, is that as TikTok has become increasingly popular, particularly with younger people and Gen Z, that it has become a real outlet for free expression in a different way than other social media apps. So I'm joined today by two excellent scholars who have certainly weighed in on this debate over the past couple of months. As Kayla mentioned, we're joined by Will Duffield and Jamil Jaffer. And so just to open it up, we'll start with the, the kind of basic question. Sh- uh, should TikTok be banned in the United States? And Jamil, I'll go to you first. Uh, absolutely, uh, Jennifer. I think it should be banned. Um, and I realize I say that, you know, carefully, um, having lived through in the 80s, the banning of two live crew down in Florida and the release of their single banned in the USA. For those of you too young to know what I'm talking about, go check it out. It's worth listening to. Um, but look, um, TikTok is not American expression, right? Yes, there are Americans on the platform you know, tens, hundreds of millions of Americans, but it is not an American owned and operated app. It is run by a company called ByteDance, as you pointed out, in China, subject to Chinese law. Um, and uh, the fact of the matter is that they they can and do collect tremendous amounts of information on the people uh, that use TikTok, that employ it, that are on the platform. And you think about it, it's not just um, these dance videos or free expression, right? Um, when you are on a social media app of that variety, they collect all sorts of information about where you go, what you do. Uh, as we know, um, uh, app tracking uh, is common. It's now been it's now been uh, been limited on certain devices, iPhones and the like. Um, but um, it's not just when you're using 
using that app. It's, it can oftentimes, uh, apps will cross track and websites and the like will track what you're doing. They'll collect data about, uh, about where you are when you create content, when you, when you message, it'll create, it'll take information about who you're in communication with. There's a tremendous amount of information. And remember these videos themselves as well have tremendous amounts of information about how you behave, who you interact with, what you say, what you think, how you speak. You take all that information and you combine it with databases that we know the Chinese government has stolen, right? Uh, the, the huge US OPM database of all security clearance information that the US government had um, and all the clearances and all the people who were vetted by uh, the US government for security clearances for decades. You know, um, uh, databases like uh, like uh, databases about hotel uh, hotel stays, databases about credit reporting agencies, healthcare databases. These are all databases that we know that the U.S. government has acknowledged have been stolen by the Chinese government at a corporate level, right? At a government level, right? Then you take this ByteDance information, right? That's being collected by TikTok, and the Chinese government requests it, can get lawful authorized access to it. Remember, there's no real distinction between the public and private sector in China like there is in the United States, right? We tend to think of, oh, well, it's a company, so it's different than the government. That distinction is not nearly as solid in uh, China or with the Chinese Communist Party as it might be here. And so the ability to get that data, there's no judge, there's no, there's no barrier between the Chinese Communist Party, the government apparatus and industry. They just take, they combine, they work together. So that, all, that, that data comes all back, right? And imagine it combined and imagine it training an AI model. Now you can take hotel data, credit card data, TikTok information, who they connect with, uh, the kind of videos they, 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 uh, they post online, the kind of conversations they're having, some of their speech patterns and the like. Now you have tremendously valuable information for thinking about where people are going to be, how they're going to act, what they're going to do, for for mimicking their their voice patterns, mimicking their 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 uh, their you know potentially creating deep fakes. There's a tremendous amount of value there. Now, could you get that from elsewhere? Yes. Is it a lot easier if it's an app that's created in China, run by a Chinese company, uh, subject to Chinese law? Absolutely. Should Americans be using that app? No. Should we should we boot it out of our country? Of course we should. It's not like there aren't plenty of other places for free speech to take place. This is not a government platform. It's a private sector thing, right? It is perfectly fine. Free speech will not die in America if TikTok was gone overnight. That's my case. Over to you, Will. Oh, right. Will, uh, as I say, I'll, I'll turn to you for for a rebuttal. You know, is it, Jamil laid out, you know, what seems like a, a concerning case. We've heard the similar talk from many in Congress. Will, why shouldn't we ban TikTok? So I think for a lot of the reasons that Jamil just laid out in real competition with China, TikTok is a red herring. But banning it will harm American speakers at home and American firms abroad. Firstly, I, I reject the idea that social media platforms are fungible and that valuable speech isn't lost when we take one away. You can't let them eat Snapchat. If we were to ban Parler tomorrow because of its Russian connections, you would similarly be cutting out a segment of speakers who have made their business livelihood in some cases or just choose to express themselves, can best express themselves via a particular platform. And so there's something lost there. But Ultimately, all of the categories of, of data outside of TikTok that Jamil has mentioned are much, much more important, much more dangerous in many cases than anything the CCP would be getting directly from TikTok. And most of what it can get from TikTok, it can get just as easily or really as cheaply um, elsewhere. Absent some kind of broad-based geolocative location protection law or, or rules, this kind of information, people's hotel stays, where they travel to and from, is freely available or easily purchasable on a secondary market of, of data brokers. As well, the content that people post, whether they're posting it to TikTok or, or YouTube, it's publicly available. The Chinese can hoover that up if they want. But ultimately, the kind of OPM hack data that they've received, the Equifax hack data, whatever they get from that balloon flying over our country, is just far, far beyond anything they would get from TikTok in terms of danger. And the idea that combining all of that with TikTok gets them something special is like pouring ketchup into the sea to make a sauce. Um, what, what's ultimately added from TikTok there is, is going to be minimal. Uh, but there are real costs to banning it, um, and, and not just for the American speakers who rely on it, 
um, not just for the kind of American cultural throughput that the platform provides. Remember, this is a platform, TikTok, that is banned in China. The CCP considers it dangerous for its citizens to be exposed to the kind of speech that Americans and others publish on TikTok. And the fact that people, not just in China, but all over the world can look into an American living room and be awed by our wealth and freedom is a valuable thing. But banning TikTok won't just hurt those speakers. It'll hurt American firms abroad. And I think that's one of the least appreciated um, reasons or, or concerns in this. Most tech giants are American. They operate under American rules and they've been able to spread and grow internationally because they've worked under an, an open system. And to ban TikTok now to force divestment shakes that system up in, in response to, I think, a, if it is a threat, a very unique one, a pretty rare one, and will ultimately do much more harm to American tech power, cultural power, um, by shaking that system up and encouraging other countries to ask for their own national spinoffs. We've already seen some of those lo um, data location demands, um, lo local subsidiary demands, but I think this would really turbocharge that. Um, and, and finally, if we are to think about banning TikTok, there are much better and worse ways of doing it. Um, some, some kind of you know, federal action, uh, a new law, um, won't just, again, turbocharge that kind of international um, demands, but also give the federal government new, in my mind, completely unnecessary powers um, to, to restrict Americans' ability to receive speech from all over the world, not, not just China. Um, so there, there are less restrictive means if we're concerned mostly about you know, important U.S. persons, military servicemen. I think a ban on TikTok on government devices is fine. And even barring uh, U.S. government employees or military personnel from installing it in their own personal devices would be all right. But that's a much more limited action than saying to every single American man, woman, and child, you can't use this anymore because we're concerned about what the Chinese might do with your data. Well, I want to start our, our further conversation with something you brought up at the end there, this question of if there are these national security concerns, are there less restrictive means than a ban that could address some of these? We've seen TikTok itself put forward what it refers to as Project Texas, something that would kind of free localize all U.S. data to Texas, have a lot of government oversight. Um, this has kind of been their plan put forth to, to try and assuage some of these fears or, or concerns. We've also, though, seen that, you know, with many people, well, even if they have concerns, calls for a complete ban remain, you know, relatively unpopular, not only for, for First Amendment grounds, but because this app is very popular with users. Users don't necessarily want it to be, be taken away. And, and even if they're concerned about the data collection, may, you know, see this as a, a trade off that they're willing to make. What would you say are some of those, you mentioned a few of them earlier, but what would you say are some of those less restrictive steps that if there are these kind of data security concerns could be taken? Well, you, you bring up Project Texas. I, I think it importantly and adequately addresses concerns about misuse of the TikTok algorithm. That's not something Jamil has brought up, but it is something that others have, have expressed worries about that TikTok could tune its algorithm to depress Americans or discourage them from supporting Taiwan or something like that. But yes, hosting that algorithm on Oracle hardware in the United States where Oracle can, can review it, um, I, I think really limits the ability. Jamil's shaking his head, but even when t uh, Twitter has made big changes to its algorithm, those have been publicly visible. Uh, people have, have picked that up. Now, under China's national security letter process, uh, and given the kind of leakiness of data, employee permissions, that sort of thing, I'm, I'm skeptical that, that Project Texas handles the data, data exfiltration concern. Um, because again and again, we find ByteDance employees with kind of unexpected access to U.S. Um, TikTok data. And it, it's a hard um, 
capacity to, to disprove. Um, however, ultimately, I just don't think the data is important enough to warrant banning individual Americans' access to this. Uh, as I said, least less restrictive means like um, limiting government or military personnel use. And if we are to finally ban it, doing so via CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., which has oversight over TikTok's 2017 acquisition of an American app called Musical.ly, gives kind of a unique way of forcing divestment and probably an eventual ban because I don't think the, the CCP is likely to allow us to kind of expropriate a tech gem. Um, but ultimately, that's a, a limited solution for those who are, are concerned about Chinese access to American data more broadly. It doesn't handle the DJI drones that I use. Jamil, I know this is an audio only show, but as Will mentioned, you, you were kind of shaking your head at, yeah. at some of this talk around Project Texas and whatnot. Uh, why do you think that these less restrictive steps are, are insufficient to, to deal with these concerns? Um, or, or that's at least my read of, of kind of your reaction uh, to, to Will's comments. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think Will raises a good point uh, that just in the last couple of weeks, TikTok has claimed has claimed that they will give access to their algorithms and their source code. Mind you, it's been three, four years since we've been talking about Project Texas and about TikTok moving their servers to the U.S. and the data. It's only in the last couple of weeks that, that TikTok has claimed it will provide its, its data uh, and open source its algorithms and the like. So I'll believe it when I see it, number one. Uh, number two, just a month or a month and a half earlier, the CEO uh, of, of TikTok uh, testified, or CEO of ByteDance, I should say, uh, testified before Congress and would not commit that he did not have Chinese government oversight over his company or of its data, even if the data was put in te put you know under Project Texas in the United States under Oracle supervision and, and the like. And so you know the fact that the CEO himself couldn't commit that publicly. Uh, after repeated questioning, and by the way, repeated bipartisan questioning, right? This idea somehow that like this is you know this is you know one party or, or a small group of people in the United States who think that the banning is a good idea. There is virtual unanimity um, in 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 Congress that TikTok is a train wreck. Yes, there's a, there's a, there's a large uh, you know group of support for it in people in content creators and users, and we've all seen the videos of. You know that TikTok's been running um, on 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 cable with American content creators who whose family's been saved by the money they made on TikTok, or who've 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 you know gotten veterans content out there. By the way. All of that is Chinese propaganda. Let's be really clear about what those ads you're seeing are, right? That's ByteDance, Chinese government funded propaganda through ByteDance, through TikTok USA. Let's not kid ourselves about what that is. And so don't give in uh, to that, to that temptation. Um, and look, I don't, I don't disagree with Will that, um, uh, that when you take one platform off, you're gonna. There's some amount of content that might not come back. But the reality is that um, that the platforms are fungible in a significant way, right? Yes, it's not gonna be exactly like TikTok. It's not gonna have the same uh, same uh, same uh, spectrum. But look, you know, I mean, who remembers uh, MySpace, right? MySpace is gone, long forgotten. But that was the place where all of us went back in the day, and then it was replaced by you know by Facebook, and now Facebook is Meta, and you've got Instagram, and you've got Snapchat, and and next year there'll be another. 20 of them, right? Like the idea that that that, that TikTok is going to be the end all be all and is this amazing speech platform. Let's be real, right? The vast majority of content on TikTok is not is not speech. It's it's dance videos and cat videos and the like. Um, and so yeah, there's there's some amount of speech. Is that is that speech going to be replaced somewhere else? I mean, you've got to be kidding me if you don't think real content creators who care about getting their voice out there are not going to find another methodology for expressing themselves. And by the way, there's no First Amendment issue here at all. These are private platforms. Even if they were government spaces, which they aren't, even if they were, the government has the ability under long standing First Amendment doctrine to regulate the time, place, and manner of speech. And so this idea somehow that, like, oh, you know, woe is me, like this hand ring, like, you know, the other Jamil Jaffer, right, who works at the ACLU, right, or used to work at the ACU now runs and runs the First Amendment Center, you know, like, we're going to see a, the death of the First Amendment if, if, if TikTok is banned. I mean, give me a break. Well, I'm sure you want to respond to those First Amendment concerns. I, I do want to bring this up in a bit of a broader context, too, though, of there's a lot of debate about 
online speech in general. Um, we've seen a lot of debate about, you know, the whether or not today's social media platforms are, are too big. And then you have TikTok coming in as this really disruptive competitor. How much are the debates about TikTok unique, um, both related to kind of this question of the, the First Amendment? And how much are the debates about TikTok just the same and with a, a different kind of main character as the debates that we're having about YouTube or Facebook or, or Instagram? Yeah, a, a lot to respond to there, really. I, I think, first of all, we need to avoid being, in my mind, chauvinistic about expression and, and speech. You know, one one person's uh, vulgarity is another lyric, another's lyric, and people express themselves via dance um, by showing off their pets. I communicate with French owners on TikTok of the same kind of weird hound that I have. You don't see many of them in the States, but they post lots of hunting videos with them on TikTok. Um, but more broadly to the kind of unanimity around this in Congress, I agree it's bipartisan, but it's bipartisanly unfortunate. And I think a lot of it stems not just from concern about China, but concern about what Americans are choosing to post and watch on TikTok, which does, in my mind, raise First Amendment concerns when this becomes a motivating force in this. Uh, in the 1980s, we were much more confident in our cultural output, in how the world would, would view us and, uh, and the speech that we put out there. And we passed something called the Berman Amendment, which limits the president's authority under AIPA to restrict the flows of information. And while there's not a constitutional issue with removing or waiving that today, I, I think it does speak very unfortunately to the current um, state of American elites on both the left and right, that they don't see the value in in this, in their constituent speech in many cases. So one of the things that has happened recently is we saw Montana become the first state to pass what would be considered a, a broad TikTok ban. This is almost immediately challenged in court, both by TikTok users and then in a separate lawsuit by the company itself. A lot of our conversation so far has focused on this debate at a federal level. Jamil, I'll start with you. Is there anything different about if we were to start to see TikTok bans such as Montana's pop up at a, a state level? Do you think that that doing this, at, even if you think this is necessary, do you think there are any concerns about doing this at a, a state by state level as opposed to a federal level? Yeah, I mean, look, we've seen efforts like this happen on campuses and the like um, in, in various public university systems and now at a state level at Montana. I think this kind of piecemeal uh, regulation, um, it, this it, this is really a national security and foreign policy issue. It's something that should be dealt with at the federal level and we should have consistency across the board. Um, I, I'm, I'm fine with states doing it, but I think at some, at some point when you have one, two, three, four, five states doing it, the federal government's going to need to, and there's a benefit of uniformity uh, in the federal government getting involved and getting engaged here. Um, all that being said, I think, you know, one of the interesting things is a lot of folks online when uh, when this Montana ban came out said, oh, you know, I can't believe, look at Montana acting like, you know, you know, like Russia or China banning a speech platform, right? I mean, there's a vast difference and there's not moral, uh, you know, parallels between a democratic system, a democratically elected governor, a Democ democratically elected legislature deciding the people of Montana don't need this thing versus the Chinese Communist Party banning a kind of speech or a platform or the like. There is a, there's a vast there's a vast difference, right? There, there is no electoral process. There, there is no democratic legitimacy. We have that here, and our laws and our system, our system of separated powers, our system of, of independent, independent, an independent judiciary, none of that is present in China, and we cannot create a moral equivalence between what they do, what the Russians do, what the Chinese do, and what we do in the United States. There is not moral equivalence, and this is a very dangerous place to go right now. We talk about this question of, you know, about, you know, about differentiating between kinds of speech. I didn't mean to suggest that, you know, if you want to post cat videos, they can and they should, right? But let's be real, right? We talk about the First Amendment. The First Amendment's not about cat videos. The First Amendment's not about dance videos. And yes, if people are expressing themselves and expressing their political views through dance, the, the motivating construct behind the right of free speech and the right, uh, the rights contained in the First Amendment are about political expression. And that's what this is about. And sh if TikTok were to go away tomorrow, there will be no significant diminution in the ability of Americans to express themselves politically. 
right? To the extent there is, for a hot minute, there's going to be a million platforms that pop up, including ones that exist today, that will make it very easy for Americans to express themselves in all variety of manners without the need to have to share all their data with the Chinese government through ByteDance. Traditionally, the First Amendment sets these sorts of decisions about what newspapers or platforms we use beyond democracy. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that certainly Montana's actions aren't akin to those of China. Um, and really, the structure of their ban worries me more than the target. This is the first time we've seen intermediaries, the app stores, recruited into under penalty of tremendous daily fines enforcing this kind of restriction. And I don't want to move towards an America where you see New York, for instance, taking this up to uh, prevent the creep of Russian hate speech via parlor or something. Um, but under the, the kind of justification as written in, in Montana, um, they certainly could make a case for it. And again, I think that takes us in a concerning direction. There are also real interstate commerce issues um, in dragging those platforms in as the enforcers here. It would be one thing if they'd attempted to restrict it at the, the individual user level. I think that's frankly much less practicable uh, to, to go around checking Montanans' phones for TikTok. And so that's why they end up with the, the focus on the intermediaries. But that doesn't make it good or, or lawful. Um, finally, on, um, on, on, you know, international comparisons, if anything, it, it looks more like Turkey, which has uh, really pioneered the use of dragging app stores and intermediaries in to work as enforcers for sometimes, you know, broadly supported democratically uh, restrictions on speech, but those, those that nevertheless leave minorities out in the cold. Um, and on, on the state level, I think you know, we should be aware and concerned of that, uh, too, because the potential benefits of a Montana level ban are even more minimal um, than federally banning it and, and forcing uh, the Chinese to buy our geolocative of data on the open market like everyone else. Beyond the debate about TikTok, there also seems to be a, a growing debate about, you know, cybersecurity in general, whether it's at individual companies or, or for the federal government. There's also a continued debate about data privacy. What steps do you think individuals and, and policymakers should consider if they want to improve data security and or data privacy separate from just this issue of TikTok? And how much would those steps help resolve some of these concerns about TikTok? Look, I think that um, I think there's a real opportunity here uh, for those who are concerned about data privacy uh, to think about, you know, there's a lot of think about what TikTok is collecting, and what they have the ability to collect. Right. There's a lot of folks who are, you know, who, who are on the pro keep TikTok alive side of the debate. I don't think that I don't think that necessarily includes Will, um, but that say we really need to regulate all these content platforms and really need to cram down on these American companies that are lawfully collecting data that have consent from their users that, 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 that notify their users and the like. Right. We need to cram down on them. Right. But TikTok, well, that's fine. We need to, we should let them stay alive and do what they're doing. Right. I think it's very, it's a very odd dichotomy. And again, I'm not saying that's Will's point. I think Will's point also about, about dragooning in uh, some of these uh, app stores and the like uh, may be very problematic. At the end of the day, though, it's, it's hard to th imagine um, how you bar. Uh, you know, a, a, an app like TikTok without um, without making it impossible for Americans, whether it's you know the companies or individuals to interact with that app, right? To download or the like, right? Um, you could you could do some of the things that we've done on semiconductors and the like by barring access to American technology like that might solve the problem. That might be a way to do it if you were going to do it. Uh, that's different than what Montana has done. So there are tools, but mostly at the federal level that we can use those at. Um, but, you know, to, to come back to, to, to your point, uh, Jennifer, on cybersecurity, this is about individual responsibility, right? This is about users knowing what data is being collected about them, knowing about what options are available to them, and then taking advantage of those. And, you know, I'm a big believer in if we want to force transparency upon companies, if we want, whether that's TikTok or the like, right, if we want to force uh, responsibility upon users. But these ideas that we should tell people, right, um, when it comes to American companies or, or, or companies that are, that are governed by the rule of law, that operate according uh, in democratic environments, right, for those apps, I think we treat them differently than, than an app that is, that is, that is a, a bound to a, a non-free 
adversarial government, those are fundamentally different. And for those those apps and those things, there's a marketplace. And we can we, we create transparency in that marketplace. We can create transparency about what data is available, what data they collect, what 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 data you how you can get your data back. But once you've done that, then that should be consumer choice, right? But there is a difference between consumer choice when it comes to a company that operates in a democratic system and a company that operates under a communist system without a difference between, without a separation between the legislative, the executive, the judiciary, and a country we know, we know is going to use those capabilities that Access has to its private sector for adversarial purposes. We saw them do it with Huawei. We know they're doing it with TikTok. We got to be realistic about the environment we're walking into. It's not, talking about Meta and Google and what they collect is not like talking about what TikTok and ByteDance collects. They're just fundamentally different. I, I would say it goes even beyond Meta and Google here when we're thinking about what kind of broad-based data privacy rules would we need to prevent China from having access to, say, Americans' uh, individual trip-level geolocative data. And we ought to use this as an opportunity to say, okay, what categories of data are we most concerned about TikTok hoovering up or the Chinese potentially buying not directly from Apple and, and Google, much more likely from your cell service provider, um, and and to issue some kind of uh, universal rules about how that data needs to be handled, who it can be sold to, when it can move abroad. And at that point, if TikTok can't comply with those rules, that's one thing. But to single them out now exactly invites that kind of foreign action that I'm concerned about that I don't think um, failure to comply with some broader based rule would. Uh, now, this shouldn't be taken as an opportunity to go after the business models of all of these American firms, as I think some some privacy hawks do. Uh, but if we're seriously concerned in a national security sense about Chinese access to this kind of data, it does go way beyond TikTok. And to me, TikTok looks like a red herring. I want to thank you both for joining us today. Uh, Will, I'm going to turn to you first. If you could just kind of give us in a, a minute or two your overall takeaway of where you think this debate is headed next, as well as where our audience can find any of your work on this topic. Well, I think as this conversation about how or, or uh, whether to ban TikTok moves forward, we just need kind of an unflinching focus on the CFIUS process. Um, it has the capacity to deliver some kind of divestment um, without more broadly empowering the federal government to regulate our interactions on the internet with foreigners, uh, without stepping down to the, the phone level um, to police which apps were, were running at any given time. Um, and the Moving forward from whatever decision is is made there, uh, we take a broader look at, at data security um, rather than focusing on particular firms or even countries. Uh, because again, this kind of stuff is leaky once it's out there, once it's resold. Uh, but at, the, at this stage, given what we've seen from TikTok, the kind of data that it collects and its value to American speakers, um, well, we can recognize the, the concerns about Chinese having access to user data. That's something for users to be warned about and make their own decisions, not a reason to both prohibit Americans from using an app that they enjoy and upend the international liberal internet paradigm that has done so well for so many American firms. And Jamil, over, over to you as well. Where do you think this debate is, is headed next? Yeah, Jennifer, it's a great question, and I really want to thank Will for 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 being a, a great partner in this debate. And I, I think he made some he's made some great points, and I, I think there's a lot of validity uh, to the concerns that Will has raised. At the end of the day, um, I come down on the side as as we've already talked about uh, of, of taking TikTok out. It's a it's a it's a it's a Chinese Communist Party owned and operated institution. Um, we can argue about whether you know ByteDance is is or is not, and whether TikTok USA is or is not. But the reality is. 
that's the rules they operate under. It's not our system. It's not the same thing. Um, and I think I think that there's broad understanding and consensus in Congress um, and increasingly in the American public on this. Maybe not amongst TikTok users specifically, and not those people that TikTok has paid to do those those TV commercials uh, for sure. Uh, but I think there is a consensus building in this country. And I think at the end of the day, in the long run, uh, whether it's through a series of creative states like we've seen Montana do and the like, you're going to see a movement across the country and at the federal level, ultimately banning TikTok and banning other tools of state uh, misinformation, disinformation. One, one thing that Will raised that I didn't have a chance to talk about today was it's not just collecting data. It's about also shaping messaging coming to Americans and, and, American, and the American public. We know that the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians have done that actively on our own platforms, much less their ability to do it on platforms they own and operate. We shouldn't, we shouldn't accept that. Um, America should be more discerning. I grant you Will is right, right? We sh- America should be more discerning. Um, but but it doesn't it doesn't prevent us nor should prevent us from saying, look, this is a this is a own and operate institution, just like Huawei, just like other other uh, organizations we've seen in the past. We don't need them here. Uh, and and we can we can do without it, and speech will not suffer. Um, at the end of the day, you can find me online, uh, Jamil underscore and underscore Jaffer on on Twitter um, and nationalsecurity.gmu.edu if you want places to find us online. And Will, where can they find you? I'm at Will underscore Duffield on Twitter and Cato.org slash Will Duffield. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you all for being with us today and taking the time. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, Really appreciate you lending us your expertise and insight. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 